Hi everyone, and welcome to another training session with CourseMed. Today we're going to do the knee protocol, a very common scan in the MSK MRI world. We're going to do this step by step, a nice slow pace to make sure you get all the images of high quality. I'm going to swap over to the CourseMed MRI simulator. So let's get started. Here we have the CourseMed MRI simulator, which is where I'll demonstrate how to run this protocol. In MRI, we always face a trade-off between three key metrics. Scan time, resolution, and signal-to-noise ratio. If we improve one of these metrics, it reduces the performance of the others. So how should we decide what to prioritize when it comes to knee MRIs? The knee is a small body area with many complex structures like ligaments and cartilage. So it requires a high resolution to see the anatomy clearly. And while the knee protocol is commonly requested, we can typically complete this scan relatively quickly. Therefore, you may want a slightly prioritized resolution, then SNR, and lastly, scan time. Prioritizing resolution ensures you get the image detail you need. However, this is only a general recommendation. If you need a faster scan time, then reduce the resolution slightly to get the right balance that fits the needs of your patient and clinic. So what medical conditions can we diagnose with the knee MRI protocol? Some of the most common conditions are ligament and meniscus tears and post-traumatic injuries. These are best detected with a proton density fat saturated sequence, which enhances soft tissues and fluids without fat signal interference. Other common conditions are bone tumors, cysts, and osteochondritis desiccans. These show up well on a T1 sequence, which highlights fat and bone structures. We also have cartilage defects, inflammation, and bone marrow edema. These can be clearly seen on T2 sequences, which highlights fluid-related abnormalities and edema. Finally, we have tears of the anterior cruciate ligament and low-grade ligament injuries. These are best seen with a dedicated PD FATSAT ACL sequence, which is optimized to assess the anterior cruciate ligament. Now, let's get started with our simulation. We will assume that the patient is already positioned in our scanner, following all the safety regulations. The first step is to check the hardware settings of our MRI system. We have selected a knee coil array. This coil is physically positioned surrounding the knee to be studied, which provides perfect coverage and ensuring adequate signal acquisition. We are also using a magnetic field strength of 1.5 teslas and a maximum gradient strength of 45 milliteslas per meter. This configuration is standard in many clinical MRI systems today. Now, we will upload the initial localizer images of the knee in the viewports. These images must be captured in three anatomical planes, axial, sagittal, and coronal. We will then scroll to the central slices that allow us to visualize the anatomical structures of the knee for planning. Next, we will add the protocol sequences for this study. A standard knee protocol will typically include seven pulse sequences, three proton density fat saturated sequences in sagittal, coronal, and axial views, a sagittal T1, a coronal T2, and two special sequences to evaluate the anterior cruciate ligament. However, this selection is only a general recommendation. Your clinic may have its own requirements, and if so, you should follow those specifications. Let's now begin our workflow with the sagittal PD FATSAT sequence. For sagittal planning and angulation, we will use the lateral condyle of the femur as a reference. This structure runs parallel to the anterior cruciate ligament, which we can see clearly here. In the coronal plane, we will adjust the slices to align with the midline of the femur and tibia. We will then angulate the slices parallel to the lateral condyle. Now, let's center the slices and adjust the slice thickness and gap 
to achieve suitable spatial resolution for evaluating the knee. We also need to set the number of slices to ensure complete coverage from right to left. In most MRI systems, we can select a box view to display the underlying anatomy. This is very helpful to ensure coverage and angulation. Let's align the slices parallel to the midline of the femur and the tibia. Next, let's verify that we have a short echo time and longer repetition time to give us a proton density contrast. The bandwidth and bandwidth per pixel must be high enough to avoid chemical shift artifacts and foldover suppression should be enabled to prevent wraparound artifacts. Enabling foldover suppression will display an extended dotted line along the phase encoding direction. The phase direction is typically set from superior to inferior. This helps us avoid flow artifacts caused by pulsation from the popliteal artery. Here, we can clearly see the artery and its flow direction. We should always set a turbo factor or echo train length that is optimized for the selected echo time. Since we want a proton density contrast, we use a lower turbo factor to minimize T2 weighting. We must also ensure to use spectral fat suppression to nullify the signal from the fat. Before we run a sequence, we should always verify that the acquisition time and resolution are suitable. Let's now save and run this pulse sequence. Next, we will plan the coronal plane, starting by setting the correct orientation. The anatomical reference for the coronal plane is the medial and lateral condyles of the femur. We will align the slices parallel to them. We will also align the slices parallel to the midline of the femur and the tibia, as shown here in the sagittal localizer. While planning, we can upload the necessary sequences to ensure precise angulation and coverage. Let's bring back the sagittal localizers again to ensure accurate planning. Now that the angulation is set, let's add the required number of slices. A total of 32 slices should fully cover the anatomy from anterior to posterior. We must also configure the slice thickness and gap for optimal spatial resolution. Now, we can center our slice package. Let's verify that the echo time and repetition time are set for proton density contrast and that the selected bandwidth and fold over suppression settings ensure optimal image quality. These parameters match those in the sagittal PD fat sat sequence, which helps prevent pulsation artifacts from the popliteal artery. As in the previous sequence, we use a spectral fat sat pulse and a short turbo factor for the selected echo time. Let's verify that our acquisition time and resolution are suitable. We will then save and run this pulse. Next, we will plan the axial plane, starting with its orientation. The slice thickness and gap must be set to provide a high enough resolution. We will angulate the slices perpendicular to the femur and the tibia. The slices must also be parallel to the meniscus these black structures that you can see here. Additionally, they should be parallel to the lateral and medial condyles of the femur, which you can see here in the coronal localizer. Let's upload the localizers and optimize the axial plane planning following these guidelines. We must set enough slices to cover the knee joint, starting from the patella's border, which are visible here at the upper part of the knee joint down to the tibial tuberosity, shown in this section. It's recommended to use a phase encoding direction from right to left to direct pulsation artifacts in that direction. This ensures a clear visualization of the knee's joint structures. Let's check that the echo time and repetition time are set for proton density contrast and that the bandwidth and foldover suppression are set for optimal image quality. 
Finally, we will verify that the turbo factor and spectral fat saturation pulse are correctly set. Now, we are ready to save and run this sequence. Next, for the sagittal T1 sequence, we can copy the geometrical parameters from the sagittal PD fat set. Most MRI scanners offer this feature, which enables radiologists to compare images more clearly. For this T1 contrast, we will check that the echo time and repetition time are appropriately set. The turbo factor must also be kept short to ensure a short effective echo time, which is needed to create a pure T1 contrast. Let's save and run this sequence. Now, we will continue with the coronal T2 sequence. Here we can also copy the geometry from the coronal PD fatsat to the coronal T2. The echo time and repetition time are correctly set for T2 contrast. We also use a higher turbo factor to ensure the effective echo time remains long, which enhances T2 contrast. Once we have verified that the resolution and acquisition time are suitable, we can click on save and run this pulse sequence. Let's work on the final two special sequences, starting with the sagittal PD fatsat of the anterior cruciate ligament. For this sequence, we will use the axial localizers to identify the structure of the anterior cruciate ligament. This black line represents the ligament's location and orientation. Now, let's angulate the slice parallel to this structure. Perfect. We have now aligned it parallel to the ligament. The slice thickness for this sequence is typically thinner to achieve higher spatial resolution and allow careful evaluation of the ligament. Let's center the position in all three planes. The number of slices must be limited to cover only the ligament area. This sequence will use proton density contrast, so we must ensure we have a short echo time and a longer repetition time. We will also verify that the fat suppression pulse and turbo factor are correctly aligned and optimized for this contrast. A shorter turbo factor ensures we get a pure PD contrast with minimal T2 weighting. We can then save and run this sequence. Finally, let's plan the coronal PD fat sat for the anterior cruciate ligament. We will first set the plane orientation and then adjust the slice thickness and gap, which should be thin for optimal spatial resolution. The number of slices should be just enough to cover the ligament area. Now, we can use our reconstructed sagittal PD fatsat of the ligament to plan our coronal view. Let's take a closer look at the ligament. Here, we can observe its full extension from origin to insertion. Now, let's set a parallel angle to the ligament and center the slices accordingly. Excellent. The contrast parameters for this sequence are typically identical to those in the sagittal view of the ligament. We can now save and run this final sequence. Now that all sequences have been run, let's analyze and review our results. We will start with the proton density fat suppressed images. Proton density is superb for detecting soft tissue conditions like ligament and meniscal tears. The fat suppression also helps us see fluid collections more clearly, which lets us detect conditions like bone marrow edema, fat pad edema, bursum, and paramenescal cysts. This sequence is typically acquired in three planes, axial, sagittal, and coronal, in most clinical facilities. It provides excellent tissue contrast across knee joint structures, including cartilage, bone marrow, and ligaments. 
It is important to review the images as they are reconstructed to ensure the patient hasn't moved and that the image quality meets the requirements for optimal interpretation. Let's now look at the T1 image. This contrast makes fat appear bright, which makes it excellent for visualizing the structure of the bone and overall knee anatomy. It also helps us detect bone cysts, tumors, and soft tissue lesions. T2 weighted images, on the other hand, make fluids appear bright. This makes T2 great for detecting fluid-related conditions like knee cartilage, especially to see the interface between cartilage and synovial fluid. It's also ideal for assessing bone marrow edema and conditions involving inflammation, such as arthritis. Finally, the dedicated anterior cruciate ligament views lets us take a closer look at the structure's integrity, which is often affected by injuries or trauma. With that, we will wrap up this video tutorial. I hope you have now gained a greater confidence in how to perform a knee MRI protocol. To recap, here are the most important takeaways to remember. First, prioritize high resolution, then signal to noise ratio, and lastly, scan time. Normally, we prioritize scan time when a protocol is so highly requested as the knee study. However, because knee scans can be completed relatively quickly, we often don't need to speed them up further. Instead, we must prioritize high resolution and strong SNR to see the knee's small size and complex structures clearly. Second, we mainly use proton density fat saturated sequences for this study. This type of sequence provides excellent soft tissue contrast, which helps us see the joint structures, ligaments, and cartilage clearly. They also highlight fluids while suppressing signal from fat, which also lets us detect fluid-related abnormalities like edema or inflammation. Third, make sure to avoid the common artifacts that can arise from the knee, which include chemical shift, wraparound, flow, motion, truncation, and susceptibility artifacts. Some techniques we can use to avoid these artifacts are to increase the bandwidth, activate fold over suppression, adjust the phase encoding direction, shorten the scan time, increase the resolution, and use metal artifact reduction sequences. Susceptibility artifacts are mainly caused by metal implants in the knee. In such cases, MARS sequences can help you avoid these artifacts from the metal. If you cover all these three points, you will be able to perform superb knee MRI protocols. Thanks for joining, and I will see you in our next session.